Hello, thank you again for tuning in to What Do You Think? I'm your host, Colin Sandy. Today we're talking about preventive and screening care for women. Our guest with us is Dr. Carla Cargio, lead physician, obstetrics and gynecology, North Capital Medical Center, Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group of Kaiser Permanente. Welcome, Carla. Thank you, Colin. Well, this is a topic I know very little about, okay. and of course you're an expert on. And, um, you know, they say a, a, a pound of, or an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. What, what, why, why is preventive medicine so important to women? Preventive care is important to, um, you know, humans, women, men, children, because when you can spend the time in preventing an illness from, ha um, from occurring, it saves a lot of money, it saves a lot of heartache, it saves a lot of grief, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. So preventive care is extremely important. And, you know, as a matter of fact, a lot of insurance companies, interestingly enough, are um, starting to gear their um, their physicians, their reimbursements towards preventive care. What would a woman expect on a, on a preventive care visit? Okay, that's a great question. You know, the preventive care visit is a visit that um, a woman we usually recommend to occur annually. Um, this visit comprises of several typical um, exams and tests that are done. Now, specifically in relation to, to gynecology, which is what I practice, there are several areas that um, we focus on. This includes breast health and breast screening. It includes general health and wellness. Also includes um, reproductive um, you know, screening, um, questions, um, things like that that would be covered during a preventive care visit. Okay, um, and the pelvic examination is a part of that, a part of that uh, screening process. What, what is that screen for? Well, you know, there are lots of different things that occur during a pelvic exam, but that specifically is an exam that looks for um, several types of problems that it can occur with female patients. It checks for um, you know, infections, if they're um, anatomic problems. When I say anatomic problems, I mean problems with a woman's reproductive organs, if they're like cysts on the ovaries, um, cervical abnormalities, vaginal infections. Those are the types of things that a, um, a pelvic exam would check for. Okay. Uh, is that the most important or most common exam that you do? You know, um, as a, again, as a gynecologist, yes, it is one of the more common exams that I do. Now, I do want to mention one thing here. Um, there is a test called a pap smear. A lot of women are familiar with a pap smear, and in fact, you know, they know, oh, I need to go get my pap smear done annually. Well, a pap smear is just a small part of a pelvic exam. I'm just going to go into a little bit about what a pap smear is. Um, a pap smear specifically evaluates for cervical cancer, one of the more common um, diseases that can actually kill women. Cervical cancer occurs in young women, you know, women um, as young as 20 can get cervical cancer. And what it is is the cells that line the cervix. Now the cervix is the bottom of the womb, so when a woman's having a baby, that's what opens to allow a baby to be born. And um, the cells on the cervix can change over time and that can eventually cause um, cancer to form. So what a pap smear does, it actually removes some of the cells from the cervix, and then those cells are put on a slide, and a, a, um, a specialized um, professional called a cytopathologist actually looks at this under the microscope, and they make a determination about whether these cells are normal or not. So that is a test that is done during a pelvic exam, but does not constitute the entire pelvic exam. So often when a woman says, I'm going to get my pap smear, what they really mean is they're going to get a pelvic exam, and a pap test may be done at that time. Well, how long does this exam take, and does it hurt? You know, the exam usually takes about, I would say, about five minutes to do. 
And you know, um, the question about whether or not it hurts really depends on what type of issues the woman is having. Mm -hmm. In a woman who does not have any problems, any infections, or any abnormalities, usually the exam is not painful. But sometimes women do have problems that can cause the exam to be uncomfortable. And um, a gynecologist is trained to try to minimize that discomfort as much as possible. Okay, now there's been a lot of talk about um, HPV in the news and about screening for it and you know you have various groups for it, various groups against it. First of all, what does it mean or what does it stand for and uh, why is screening for HPV so important? Okay, you know HPV stands for human papillomavirus and that is something that is um, has been really big in the news and a lot of the reason that a lot of people have heard about it is because of a vaccine that's available and that a lot of state governments you know started to um, mandate be given to girls and that's where a lot of controversy came in um, but let me back up HPV stands for human papillomavirus and that's a virus that we now know causes about about um about 90% or so of cervical cancer. So remember when I was talking about the pap smear earlier, this um, specific test would test for that virus that causes, um, that can cause cervical cancer. Yeah. Um, HPV, which I use the abbreviation for human papillomavirus, there are many, many hundreds of different types of HPV. But what a gynecologist would be most concerned about are the high-risk types. And there are only a few of the high-risk types. The reason they're called high-risk types is that these types can cause cervical cancer. Now, um, they're also low-risk types, and they can cause things like, you know, um, warts, genital warts. Um, and so what has happened now is that uh, certain companies have developed vaccines and these vaccines are designed to be given to young women prior to them becoming sexually active because HPV is a sexually transmitted infection. So that's where the controversy comes in. That's where the controversy comes in because it's approved for girls between the ages of 9 and 13. And so a lot of parents felt that the um, government was kind of saying, well, my child's going to be sexually active at a young age, you know, um, and, you know, I should give them, I shouldn't, I'm not going to give my girl this vaccine because she is not sexually active. And that's actually not the intent. The intent is to have these young women vaccinated in an age um, where vaccines are, are um, they're, they have certain, their bodies are more equipped to deal with vaccines and to produce the antibodies that are necessary for vaccines. And so that when they do become sexually active in hopefully late teens, early 20s, um, when they're a little more mature, they'll have that protection. So, you know, um, there's also one other thing I want to mention outside of the vaccine is that the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, has um, changed their screening recommendations for women okay. in terms of um, pap smears. And that often comes into um, play with the HPV test itself. Okay. Um, now, as far as a cervical cancer screening, yes. um, what age should someone have that done? Okay, great question. You know, um, cervical cancer screening, again, that's what we call the pap smear. The recommendation is to start it within three years of intercourse or age 21. So in a woman who has not become sexually active by age 18, usually I tell her to start at age 21. However, if she has become sexually active earlier, three years after her first initiation of sex. Where, do, where does breast cancer rank on the, uh, let's say, list of women's health issues? Is it still a number one, number two, number three killer? Mm -hmm. Breast cancer is the, um, outside of skin cancer, it's the most common cancer in women, okay? Um, about one in eight women will get breast cancer in their lifetime, and that's a pretty, pretty high number. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of talk has been in the media about the genetic causes of breast cancer, but that actually is only a very small portion of women, less than 5%. What are the other risk factors? Um, the other risk factors for breast cancer include um, obesity, alcohol consumption, you know, eating certain foods like um, high um, fat foods, those kind of things, smoking, those are all um, risks for breast cancer. All, also, women who started get their periods later in life or who had children later in life are at increased risk. Why is that? 
You know, the thought, um, and this is a lot of this is theoretical, but there's thought that women who started, um, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. I said starting menstrual periods later in life. I meant to say earlier in life. Mm -hmm. Women who've had um, estrogen circulating for their, through their bodies for a longer, long period, time, longer period of time um, tend to have higher rates of breast cancer. And um, having children breaks up that process. I see. Yeah. Now, breast cancer screening, does it work? You know, breast cancer screening does work. And, you know, what's available right now for breast cancer screening is um, the mammogram and what we call a clinical breast exam, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, a mammogram, what's a mammogram? A lot of women, a lot of emphasis on mammograms. You know, we have, think pink, you know, people walking around with pink, you know, um, ribbons. Now, what, what a mammogram is, a mammogram is simply an x-ray. Okay. okay, so all it is, and, and it's an x-ray done under compression. So what does that mean? the breast is put between two um, pads, and the pads are compressed down to compress the breast tissue, almost to flatten out the breast that tissue. That sounds painful. Well, and then the x-ray is done. Um, that actually is one of the main reasons a lot of women say they don't get mammograms. They've had bad experiences with mammograms or, you know, it, you know, it has been painful when it's been done. Has the techniques gotten better? Over techniques have gotten better yeah. over time. They've improved. Mammograms, technicians are a little more trained a little better so that the test does not have to be um, painful. But honestly, yes, it can be a little uncomfortable. Now, what age should uh, you start a routine regimen of breast examination? What age and what frequency? Okay. Once a woman starts um, you know, having pap smears, usually around the age of 21, we do recommend they start um, self-breast exams. And a self-breast exam is when you, after, usually about, uh, after your menses, about a day, a week or so, is that you take, you examine your own breast yourself, looking for any abnormalities or problems that can occur. Also recommend a clinical breast exam by a um, trained health provider once a year. And um, we sh we're showing you right now um, some of the ways that a self-breast exam can be done. Um, like I said, we usually recommend it to start in the 20s and once a month, one week after menses. Now, if, in a woman with no um, family history of breast cancer, we recommend starting with your mammograms around age 40. And the reason for that is that um, younger women have more breast tissue than older women. As mm -hmm. women get older, their breast tissue is replaced by fat. Mm. X-rays are able to see through fat better than breast tissue. So mammograms in younger women often just look completely white. You can't see through them because they have actual breast tissue, but as a woman gets yes. older, that changes. So usually, um, we recommend starting at age 40 every one to two years until you get to the age of 50, and then annually after that, once a year after that. Now, the one caveat I'll say to that is that women who have a first-degree relative, and when I say first-degree relative, I mean like a mother, a sister, um, you know, even like a maternal aunt who's had breast cancer at a very young age, what we call premenopausal breast cancer. So they've had right. breast cancer before they've gone through the change, which usually occurs around the age of 50. So say they were 25 and they had breast cancer. And if your mother had breast cancer when she was 25, you should start your screening at 25 as opposed to 40. Now, let's talk about the good old BMI, body mass index. Oh, that's a good one. What is it? Why do we have it? Should we care about it? Okay. Yeah, this leads us into a great talk about weight. You know, that's a favorite talk for a lot of us. You know, um, a lot of us struggle with it. And um, some of us don't, but the majority of Americans do. BMI stands for body mass index. It's a measure that's designed to give it um, a reading of your risk of illness based on your weight. And, the, and your, it's your weight in relation to your height. So what, um, you know, you're measured and then you, um, you're weighed. And then there's this formula that the, um, is put in and it comes out with your BMI. Now, there's several categories that come out um, for BNI. And a normal weight range, you'd like a BMI of less than 25. Once you start getting into a BMI of 30 or higher, you're looking at obesity. And the reason that's important is because um, once you cross into what we consider obesity, that's when your risk of <clears throat> weight-related illnesses start increasing. Um, <clears throat> once you get to a BMI of 40, 
that's when what we consider morbid obesity. And the reason it's considered to be morbid obesity is because there are a lot of morbidities like heart disease, um, you know, knee problems like um, arthritis, certain types of cancers, diabetes, high blood pressure, all those things start rapidly increasing once you cross the BMI of 40. So that's why it's so important, and that's why it's used. It's just not just another number to torture you when you come okay. to the doctor. Now, I know a, uh, a URL there popped up on the screen, and some people may or may not have been able to read it. Um, it was uh, http colon slash slash www.nhlbisupport.com slash BMI, and I guess you could go there for more information. Yeah, it's basically what that is, it's a great um, calculator that's available. Another way to do it is to Google BMI in NIH, um, and that will bring you to the site. And this website's great job, but you can put your height in, 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 in feet and inches, and your weight in, in pounds, and it generates a BMI for you, and it also gives you information on what that actually means. Okay, let's talk a little about nutrition. Nutrition, of course, is um, part of the overall um, healthiness of a person. So uh, what, what, what should we generally know about nutrition, especially women? Okay. You know, um, I'm going to, nutrition is a vast subject. I mean, there's so many different areas that can be covered. That What I'm going to do is stick to um, a couple areas and mention those. Two main areas. One of them is folic acid. Folic acid is a B vitamin, and it's in, in the United States, a lot of the bread products, um, grain products, are fortified with it. It's also something that can be found in um, green leafy vegetables naturally, and you can also get it through supplements. Okay. Now, Speaking of supplements, what, what's better, getting it through the supplement or getting it through your regular diet? Actually, the nutritionists tell us there really is not much of a difference. Right. Um, but when you get it through your um, when you get it through your diet, you also get the added benefit of fiber, of other supplements, of other nutrition there too. So if if you're looking at the difference between a pill and a and eating, you know, some spinach, it's probably better to eat the spinach because you get so much ben so many benefits. But I don't want to dissuade anyone from taking in a supplement if they're not getting these things through their diet. Okay. So the reason folic acid is so important is that if you do not have adequate folic acid in your diet, um, what can happen is that you have um, your incidence of certain types of birth defects go up, okay? And, and these the type of birth defects that go up are the kind that involve the back or the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. And these can cause pretty severe type of birth defects and it's entirely preventable by taking in this vitamin. A lot of women don't know this, especially younger women, and um, about 50% of the pregnancies in the United States are unintended, you know? So mm -hmm. basically what I tell my patients is if you're sexually active, you should be taking in adequate amount of folic acid because in order for it to work, you have to have it in your system prior to conceiving. So that's one of the most important... So you can't um, catch up afterwards. You can't catch up afterwards. And, and oftentimes, by the time a woman, a woman figures out she's pregnant, she's already five to six weeks pregnant. I see. Yeah. One other um, nutritional item that I forgot to mention, and that's calcium. So folic All acid... Those bones, yeah. yeah, folic acid is one, but calcium is so important. You know, calcium is found in dairy products. It's found in dark green leafy vegetables, like tofu, and it's also found in tofu. Um, there are a lot of juices um, that are fortified with calcium. The reason calcium is so important is that our bones are primarily made up of calcium. And especially for women, when they go through childbirth, breastfeeding, calcium is extremely important. As a woman gets older, you know, calcium becomes important. I'm sure some of you have, um, you know, heard of someone falling, an older lady falling and breaking her hip. You know, or an elderly woman who was walking, slipped on the ice fell and broke her hip. That doesn't happen to younger women. Younger women fall all the time, but they don't break their hips. And the reason is, as a woman gets older, um, and as she goes through menopause, 
the estrogen that sh she was making throughout her life, she's no longer making. And estrogen helps to protect the bones. And once a woman goes through menopause, she no longer has that protective effect of estrogen, calcium becomes that much more important. So in a woman who's been through menopause, the recommendation is, um, 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day and if you're not getting that through your diet a supplement is advised for younger women who are um, you know not through menopause yet or who are um, um, childbearing age a thousand milligrams a day is recommended one more thing I want to say about that is that um, a lot of sodas like um, caffeinated sodas like um, or even non caffeinated sodas can decrease the amount of calcium that you actually absorb. So um, it's, you know, it's best to limit your intake of those type of beverages and try to stick to things like more like juices, water, milk, um, in terms of um, drinking because the more of the uh, sodas, besides the fact they're full of right. you know, sugar, and so not good So a case a day of Diet Coke is not it's your best It's not diet. a good idea. Older women falling down, breaking their hip. Is there anything you could do exercise-wise that would make that less of a risk or at least make recovery quicker? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, exercise is extremely important. It's extremely important for all age groups. You know, as especially as a woman gets older, and I was talking about losing some of the protective effects of estrogen as she goes through menopause, what can sometimes happen is a woman can also lose muscle mass, mm. okay? And once you start losing muscle mass, your, your, um, your bones aren't as protected, you're weaker, you don't respond as well when a challenge comes in your way, okay? So um, exercising, strength, strength training especially, um, is important to keep up your strength. Walking, aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise basically means getting your heart rate up, um, you know, burning calories, so walking, swimming, cycling, jogging, anything that gets your heart rate up is extremely important. Now, I'm often asked, well, how much exercise should I do? Right. Okay, and you know, the recommendation is at least, you know, 30 minutes of physical activity most days of the week. Now, it used to be 30 days, 30 minutes of physical activity three times a week, but um, research has found that that's not quite enough to hmm. keep um, people fit, you know, and, keep, and for you to reap the benefits of exercise. So most days of the week, you know, as many times as you can get it, makes sense. So Dr. Cargill, you shared with us a number of things. And in summary, how would a woman best stay healthy? You know, um, there's so many ways to stay healthy, but what I'm going to do is just tell you a few things that can be, you know, dramatically change your health. One of the main things is being tobacco free. You know, if you're smoking, get into um, a program to help you stop smoking. Um, someone who stops smoking within one year, their health has improved so dramatically. And there's so many smoking related illnesses that are around like, you know, heart disease, emphysema, a lot of cancer. So that's one of the main things that you can do to help yourself stay healthy. You know, another thing that can be done is um, eating a, eating a um, healthy diet. And diet what I'm you know there's the food pyramid that the government puts out it's a great starting point it emphasizes um, whole grains fruits and vegetables a lot of us don't you know even get nowhere anywhere near the recommended you know five to seven fruits and vegetables a day you know you're talking about using meats and oil sparingly so again that's a really it's a good starting place and they've done a great job in actually customizing those pyramids for different um, types of activity for different people another thing that's really important is to get your recommended screening test you know um, every age group every um, you know kind of set of people has recommended screening tests and often it's very sad to sometimes t take care of women who have not had a say a pap smear in 15 years and so by the time they come in you know things are often advanced beyond the point of actually being able to cure them so getting recommended screening tests in a timely fashion is another great way and the last thing I want to say is you know if you're on a, a medication for say blood pressure 
um, or you're supposed to take medication for your diabetes, please take those medications. You know, they're not there to, um, I know you probably don't feel bad, you know, if your blood pressure is high, but these medications are designed to bring these um, your numbers back into a normal range. And if you find, if you adopt a healthier lifestyle in terms of a healthy diet and exercise, you may actually find that you can come off a lot of these medications as you lose weight and as you become more healthy. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cargill. You're welcome. This program has been made possible through the generous support of the following. Thank you for watching What Do You Think? We hope you have found this program to be informative. If you have ideas for a show topic or interview, you may reach us at whatdoyouthink at sabweb.com via email or send a postcard or letter to What Do You Think? 3469 Laurel Fort Meade Road, number 133, Laurel, Maryland, 20724.